in the woods Good afternoon guys, Dave Canterbury with Pathfinder School back with another video in the Diary of the TP. Um, what I wanted to do today was I was reading recently a book that is online in PDF format by a gentleman named Reverend Joseph Doddridge. And the book title, I wrote it down here so that I wouldn't forget it. The title to that book is... Notes on the Settlement and Indian Wars of the Western Pennsylvania and Virginia from 1763 to 1783. Bear in mind I'm reading that without my glasses on, guys, so pretty sure that's pretty close. If you just Google Joseph Doddridge, you'll find it. Um, at any rate, reading this book, he tells a very lengthy history of everything from, you know, how society operated to wilderness settlements and there are lots and lots of good reading material ideas in there or lots of historical lessons of the frontier in that time period within this book and one of the things that i noticed that he said in there going along with 21st century long hunter mentality going along with the tp series and things like that is he said that when the settlements were first settled in those areas that there were so many stone indian arrowheads around that basically they used them and picked them up and stuck them in their bags to use them for musket flints. And many times they were preferred over musket flints that were imported like English gun flint. So what I figure is they must have picked these things up, broken or whole, and then re-napped them into gun flints because an arrowhead won't work for just a gun flint without re-napping. So what I did today was I went ahead and napped a typical Cahokia style point. Now this would be a point that would be typical of the area of the Scioto Valley, Cahokia, Illinois, in those areas. This is called a Cahokia point. There were thousands of these found in Cahokia Mound. So I figured that's a typical point for this area. And I made this with U.S. Flint. Uh, Flint was traded up and down the seaboard, up and down the east coast, and all across the eastern woodlands, you know, all the way from out west down to Mexico, Canada, up, down, all around. They traded flint, obsidian, you know, jewelry, all kinds of things. So any type of American flint would work for this. Um, I believe this might be flint from Arkansas, if I remember correctly. I just knocked this off a nodule. It's actually one of the flakes that we knocked off when we did the video on how to make stone tools. That nodule, one of those flakes, is this point. I made one point on video with that, a flake. I made this Cahokia point today with another flake with the intentions of breaking this point to try to make a gun flint. So now the question is, looking at this, how do I make a gun flint from this arrowhead that is whole? So let's talk about that real quick. Okay, generally speaking, this would have been the tool or a typical tool carried of the day or of the period and it's a turn screw, very similar to the one that we made and forged in the yurt the other day, with a vent pick on one side, but this one has a turn in it right here, and it's ground off, and that is a napping hammer, is what that's for. That's to nap your gun flint, as well as you could use the turn screw for the same thing. You could use this point to nap with. So you've got a pretty good napping tool right here in this, in this multi-use tool that you use for your flintlock. So let's take our musket first of all and let's remove the gun flint that's in here now and have a look at that so that we can compare that with what we need to do to make a gun flint now this turn screw does not fit very well in this slot all right so i'm going to have to get the turn screw out that i made because it should fit better I didn't check it against this one. I only checked it against the other one. But I assume if it worked for the one, it would work for both. And it does. So you can see, you know, I ordered this one directly off the internet. And it doesn't work for my musket. It's going to have to be ground down. But the one I made does. So we'll use this one to unscrew the gun flint. Let's put this on half cock so we can get a good good close up here now the way these things are in there is there's a set of jaws that tighten down on top of this flint and you basically have a piece of flint wrapped in a piece of leather 
and that flint is pretty flat on one side. It's got a jagged edge on this side that's been broken off from firing it so many times, but that should be a single bevel sharp edge right there and it's flat on the top. So if we look at our arrowhead next to that, number one, our arrowhead is much thinner, okay, because I made this arrowhead pretty thin when I made it. Um, you know, <laughs> what does that mean? Does that mean that they used thin flints? back then and we use thicker ones now or does that mean that the arrowheads of the time period were thicker than the ones we make now well i'd say the flints were thinner because especially if they used a broken arrowhead because i know from looking at museum uh photographs and online photographs of a cahokia style point that they were fairly thin just like this one is so that gave them better flight and better accuracy so i would say that the difference is there now what i'm thinking i'll have to do is Looking at the width of this, I'd like to just try to break the front point of this off. I'd like to just snap it off right there and then nap one good bevel onto it, hopefully with this screwing, de screwing device right here, and just pop it one good time and get a good flat, sharp face. And the rest of this I'm really not that concerned about. I could knock some of these edges off too if I wanted to, but I just want to lock that in the jaws with a good sharp face right there. That's my plan. So let's see how that works out for us and we'll set this musket aside for a minute while we do it. All right. So let's get our tools that we have here to work with at hand and we have do anything different than what they would have with that they could get a hold of. I mean, this is a piece of elk antler. They could get that very easily. I really hate to break an arrowhead, but we're going to have to to do this. You can see how tough that arrowhead is. It doesn't even want to break. I done, the tip of it doesn't even want to break off. <laughs> now that's funny right there. Because you'd think that thing would be a lot more fragile than that. Okay. I mean, I'm smacking that thing as hard as I can hit it. And it's definitely not breaking off very easy. <laughs> that's funny right there. Okay. Well, let's nap it down a little bit then. That's what we have to do. That's what we have to do. Let's see here. Let's see if we can get it to break by doing this to it. So we're just using an antler tine here, and I'm just breaking it off a little at a time, just breaking it back to widen it out. And I'm breaking all the chips off of one side at the moment. Hopefully what that's going to do is just give me that one sharp edge that I need once I get it back that far and I won't have to mess with anything else. I'll have that sharp edge right there in front of me. I think we're going to have to have it wider than that for sure. Let's look at our flint that we've got you can see we really need to go back probably another i don't know quarter of an inch on that point maybe so that's fine we're just gonna have to take some off the other side to do it probably and we can do that it's not a big deal Try not to get too excited here until we kind of measure up and see what we got. See what we're looking at here. All right, we're getting close. Still got some we can take off. So now let's go back to this other side. Again. apologize if you guys can't see that very well I'm trying to kind of show you what I'm doing while I'm doing it but I'm just grabbing those edges breaking them down
A little bit of work involved here, but nothing too drastic. Okay. Let's see what we got going on here. Now we're getting close. At least we're getting close in size lengthwise. We'll probably have to work on our width a little bit in the end. Now I just want to kind of sharpen this thing up as I go. Now it's important that I keep this thing sharp. And like I said, you know, a piece of antler would not have been unheard of at all for them to have. It would have been very easy for them to get a hold of a piece of antler. Let's say kill deer all the time. And elk. Okay. We got a good sharp edge now. I think we're going to play too much more with that. That gives us a single bevel edge at this point right there. And the width is not too far off of what we had to begin with. Okay. Now, let's talk about our width for a minute. <coughs> We're going to have to do something about that as well. <coughs> so let's just take these edges and knock them down. If we can. And that definitely doesn't have to be sharp at all. It can be pretty much rounded off and it really doesn't matter. All I'm trying to do is decrease the width at this point. It doesn't really matter whether that's sharp or not. It's not going to strike the frizzin at all. Get this other side knocked down some. What we don't want to do is we don't want to break that ear off. If we break that ear off, then we're going to have a problem because our flunk's going to be short. Because we took all of our length off the front end. So now we've got to be careful not to put too much pressure on it and break that ear off. Okay, let's see what we got going on here. Not bad, a little bigger, but it's not bad. Now let's see what it looks like inside of our, and this is just a leather pad to protect it, is really all that is. So we'll set our flint that we're currently using off to the side here for a minute, and we'll put this back in our musket. jaws up screw this thing down that dovetail in the back ain't gonna hurt anything at all from that typical cahokia because it sits right in the back of that screw it actually centers that flint up pretty good well now let's see what we can do here wow look at all that spark guys <whistles> I'm telling you what let's go shoot this bad boy okay guys we've got her loaded up here got a typical uh, turkey load in here we've got this thing loaded up with four shot with about a hundred grains of powder and an equal volume of number four shot I've got this old gourd sitting out here probably at five or ten yards I'm gonna back up a little bit more than this and then zoom in on it with the camera I want to try to get the shot in the camera actually I may not be able to back up because I want to be able to get 
both the shot of this flintlock and the gourd in the camera at the same time. I want you to see how well it goes off with this napped arrowhead. So let's see if we can adjust this camera a little bit and then we'll give it a shot. Okay, we backed up a pretty fur piece now. If I zoom in on the gourd, I don't think, yeah, you might be able to see the gun. If I get right over here in front of it. Let's try it and see. Uh, you gonna be able to see that? I wanna make sure you guys can see this when I'm doing it. I'm not so sure that you're gonna be able to. Let me move this camera just a little bit. Okay, we should be set now. We moved back a little bit. We've got both the gourd and we're zoomed in. We'll zoom back, oops, sorry. We'll zoom out for a minute. Okay, you can see where the gourd's at out there. Now we'll zoom in. I'll try to get the gourd right in the corner of the picture so you can see the gunfire at the same time. All right, let's go take a look at our gourd. Try to zoom out while we're walking here. All right, there's our there's our gourd, fellas. It's uh. Pretty much obliterated. If I'd have been a turkey, I'd been on like Donkey Kong. Of course, you got to see one before you can shoot it. So that's why they call it. There's the patch right there. <laughs> that's why they call it hunting and not shooting, I guess. All right, there we go. Guys, I appreciate you joining me for another video here in the Diary of the TP. Hopefully, you enjoyed that demonstration of how to take an arrowhead and nap it into a flint for a flintlock musket. Obviously you could do that with any piece of flint. I just wanted to do the experimental archeology span to do it the way it was done back in the day according to the history books, um, according to historic writings by people like Reverend Joseph Doddridge. And a lot of people ask me, you know, how did you get started doing this kind of stuff? And this is how I got started, you know, reading history books, being interested in history, being interested in the outdoors, trapping as a kid, um, exploring the woods as a kid, just like I'm sure a lot of you did, and just continuing to experiment with things and read things and try those things that I read to see if they worked or didn't work to see what improvements I could make. That's how you learn. Continuous dirt time, experimental archaeology, and continued research. So I appreciate you joining me today, and I appreciate everything that you do for me, for my family, for my business. I appreciate your support, and I appreciate the views, that, the time that you take to watch my videos, and I'll be back with another video as soon as I can.